in subsequent videos. But let's just look at some of the important data that's come out from it now. This first one we see here, this is the adverse events types reported. So this is not adverse events, it's the different types, the different manifestations of adverse events. And we see it six times, the, the, adver the types of adverse events are six times, two times, 6.2 times higher. So six times more than we would expect. Now, to be fair, there were, uh, it was times 2.3 more vaccines were given during this time period, but we've got 6.2 times more types of adverse reactions. So what this is telling me is that the mRNA vaccines are having adverse effects on more systems of the body than conventional vaccines. And here we see that here. So here we see the influenza vaccine in purple and the COVID vaccines in red and the more types of adverse reactions are occurring in the mRNA vaccines. And just to be clear, it's the mRNA vaccines that we want taken off the market. I don't think mRNA vaccines should be currently being given to human beings or anyone for that matter at the moment until we know an awful lot more. So that's the types of reactions. This is the actual adverse events reporting system, influenza and COVID in VAERS. This is the number of reactions, the number of adverse events. And we see it's times 118. Now, as, as we mentioned, um, there was 2.3 times more vaccines being given. So that number, being generous, should be 2.3, not 118. So way more adverse reactions. Totally unacceptable numbers of adverse reactions, in my view. Why the regulators tolerate this is really quite beyond me, and I know beyond a lot of you. Um, but that's the actual number of adverse events reported. Now, this, put together by Jess Dr. Jessica Rose, has done an awful lot of brilliant... Uh, Jessica Rose has done some brilliant statistical work and scientific work on this topic and continues to uh, be a real spokesperson, a spokeswoman for the ordinary man and woman who don't have the skills that she has. Uh, and that most certainly includes me. Um, but here, here we see the age groups. So number of adverse events here. Uh, for example, we see in 0 to 4s there, 3,263. The idea that you'd be giving experimental RNA vaccines to children six months to four years of age, I just find it reckless, appalling. But there we are. And then five to 11s, a bit low in these age groups, but still an awful lot. And then the adverse, the, uh, the number of adverse reactions start to increase. And these are normalised per million doses in the different age groups. So a nice piece of work from Jessica there. Now, here we start to look at the pathology and really we've known this for some time that the vaccine is injected. The lipo nanoparticles go all around the body. They circulate to the heart. Um, the lipid nanoparticles inject their mRNA into the myocardial cells, the myocytes. The myocytes express this foreign protein. The immune system recognises this foreign protein and attacks the whole cell. It's so simple. We've had this confirmed by numerous leading doctors and scientists we've talked to. And here they say that they're perfusion stable spike protein. So the, myo the myocardial cells under the instructions, some might say under the dictate of the mRNA produces the spike protein and it, it doesn't wash away. It sticks to the surface of the myocyte, the, the myocardial cell membrane. And, and, and that's why the immune system can attack the whole thing because it's stuck on the cell membrane. And of course, that's what causes the damage to the heart, the inflammation. And we also see in this pathology slide copy, uh, we see uh, fibrotic tissue, which would indicate some degree of healing. And we also see inflammatory immune cells attracted to the site of the inflammation. So confirmation from numerous types of literature of what we've already had confirmed on this channel. The lipid nanoparticles are systemically distributed and cause the spike protein to be produced all over the body. And yet these are still tolerated by regulators. Now, 
Um, this one here, young males, the highest risk. Um, so age and sex, young males 20, 12 to 24 face the highest risk, up to seven times higher myocarditis incidence post-Moderna vaccine compared to their female counterparts. So young men at extremely high risk. Could be more information to come out from the American military yet, although that is somewhat covered in the um, in the paper. Um, hormonal influence, possibly testosterone, may amplify the immune response, increasing myocardial inflammation. Obviously, young men have the highest amounts of testosterone, as you could judge from uh, their behaviour sometimes. But uh, let's not make light of this because it's a serious issue. Um, dose and timing. Uh, risk spikes after the second dose with higher rates linked to shorter dosing intervals don't want these things close together probably it doesn't doesn't actually say this but probably worse if there's been the natural infection as well which of course was everywhere at the time moderna versus pfizer so moderna has up to three to five times higher myocardial risk compared to the pfizer vaccine likely due to its higher uh, rna concentration now, I'd say the adverse reactions from the Pfizer are unacceptable, unacceptably high, but uh, Moderna three to five times higher. Why on earth they wanted to put so much mRNA in the Moderna vaccine, I simply don't know. But of course, regardless of the amount of mRNA that you give, still the amount of spike protein that the body produces and where the body produces that spike protein is completely unpredictable. It's roll the dice and take your chances, isn't it? Uh, also, genetic and immune factors. Certain genetic markers and immune dysregulation may contribute to increased susceptibility, as really you would have uh, expected. That's usually the case. Now, this is this is quite concerning. Of those that got myocarditis, myopericarditis, 84 to 96% of Moderna uh, RNA myocarditis cases required hospitalisation. 50% showed long-term myocardial abnormalities. Now, this is particularly concerning, the reports of scarring in the myocardium. Uh, basically, as I understand the pathology, once the myocardial muscle is dead and it's scarred, um, the muscle is never going to recover. We're talking about permanent myocardial damage in a proportion of these adverse events. And 10 to 20% fatality rate, quite appalling figures. Now, what this paper really usefully does is it, um, I don't like the term debunks, but it basically debunks quite a few myths that have been put about by certain people who, who knows, may have a uh, vested interest. Let's look at those now. Um, misconception one, infection causes more myocarditis. The fact, Moderna mRNA shots pose higher risk. So the saying here that the Moderna shots have got a higher risk of myopericarditis compared to having the infection, especially in the younger, less at risk age groups whom this vaccine was forced upon essentially, in many cases. Oh, that I had more of this data and the information was freely available and dispersed in 2021. At that time, we were still, let me rephrase that, I was still taking the word of authority. I feel deceived. It won't happen again. Misconception two, uh, Moderna mRNA-related myocarditis is mild. It's not mild. It can be mild, but fact, long-term damage and death clearly documented. How much problems are still to become manifest? And of course, we could be caught talking about other complications, potential cancers. This is just, we'll stick to what this paper actually says. 
Um, Risk-benefit ratio favours uh, Moderna RNA shots. Fact, strong evidence contradicts this claim, which I would uh, agree with. Now, just a couple more graphics. This is uh, deaths related to baseline major cardiovascular diseases, and we see the numbers go up. Some extent in 2020, but also in to a higher degree in 2021, above the baseline. I'm pretty sure that was from the insurer's uh, data. I think pretty sure that's from the insurer's data. Do download this for yourself, free PDF, quite quite readable actually, very thorough. Um, and this is VERS reports of myocarditis by age and dose. So here we see the doses and you can unpick that a bit if you look at it in the PDF. But again, we see highest incidence in what? Late teenagers, young adults, very young, basically young adults going down with uh, increasing age. Um, so myths debunked. Um, Phenomena of myocarditis post SARS coronavirus 2 injection versus COVID 19 vaccine induced myocarditis. It's it's, this is pointing out, because what we were always told was the natural infection is more dangerous. This is what this is countermanding. So one, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus two, and Omicron infections have caused more cases of myocarditis than COVID-19 mRNA vaccinations refuted. mRNA vaccine-induced myocarditis is typically mild, transient, and rare, with no long-term sequelae refuted. The risk-benefit calculus favours continued use of products despite evidence of more iatrogenic vaccine caused cases refuted. Now, let's listen to the rest of the interview with uh, Dr. Kurt uh, Milholm, Senior Fellow of Pediatric, Pediatrician, uh, Pediatric Cardiologist. Joining us now to discuss this is Independent Medical Alliance Senior Fellow of Pediatric Cardiology, Dr. Kurt Kirk Milholm. Good morning to you, doctor. Welcome to the National News Desk. Great to have you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. This new study about the safety of COVID mRNA vaccines was published in the International Journal of Cardiovascular Research and Innovation, as I understand it. Tell us about the scope of this research and really your top findings from it. So it's a compilation of studies that really have been out there since 2021. We saw a signal in um, the vaccine product causing problems, especially in the young adults, especially young males, uh, that was causing heart inflammation. And so what we have done is compiled all those different peer reviewed journals, articles and data and put them in one place, easily accessible with 42 pages and 341 references of our our concerns that this is a real issue and these vaccines do little good for healthy children and young adults. Right. Were you able to distinguish the cause of myocarditis, the differential between a COVID infection versus it being just an adverse reaction to the COVID vaccine? Uh, yes, it's, it, it's, very, it, it's very clear from a number of reasons that we, we've been able to evaluate. And primarily there was a great study out of um, the Nordic countries that studied 23 million children and young adults. And they found that the people who had the young, the least amount of myocarditis were the unvaccinated. And as you increase, increase the number of vaccine doses or you use Moderna versus and Pfizer, your risk just kept stepping up in terms of your risk for myocarditis. Once again, in a, a disease state that is that is really very mild for healthy children and young adults. You know, initially this topic was so rare when we first heard about this myocarditis and the links, you know, to to the vaccine. But what does the data reveal now? So the, the, there was a study out of Lancet that showed and looked at all these children who had been harmed by the vaccine and received and had myocarditis secondary to the vaccine. And they looked at them 90 days out and a lot of things remained normal except their cardiac MRI, which showed uh, and continued inflammation and possible scarring of the heart itself 90 days out. Further studies, a, re, a new study released by Yale said that they're still seeing free floating spike protein, which is what that vaccine asks the body to make, which is a cardiotoxin still floating around in the body for over 700 days. Wow. It was supposed to just be put in and your body 
had an immune response and then it went away. But it is hanging around in some people. So it's not transitory. It's not resolving over time. I mean, there's like long-term impacts we're seeing right now. Yeah, for certain people, it is devastating and long-term issues for a disease process that they had very little risk for. Wow. So for more information, uh, you can visit imahealth.org. And doctor, we appreciate you joining us this morning to talk about this very important topic. Thank, Thank you for having me on. Uh, well, I don't think there's really any need to say more than that. Dr. Milholmes expressed that really quite well. The link for the paper is there. Download it for yourself. Very readable, nice piece of work. This is now in the public domain. Um, anyone can get it. And if regulators carry on ignoring this, um, I will be confused. Thank you for watching.